beneath the enigmatic veils of Scotland's moors, where the whispers of the past blend with the sighs of the wind, lies a secret as old as time itself. I am Professor Shadow, your guide into the realms of the unknown and the forgotten. Join me as we delve into the haunting tale of Dr. Eliza McGregor, a brilliant archaeologist whose thirst for knowledge led her to the very brink of the abyss. In her pursuit, she unearthed more than just relics. She awakened a legend that should have remained buried in the shadowy depths of Merlin's tomb, where history and horror intertwine. Eliza faced the unimaginable. From the betrayal of a trusted colleague to the unleashing of an ancient power, her journey was marked by terror and mystery. As we recount her harrowing expedition, remember, some secrets are kept hidden for a reason. What lies within the confines of these ancient walls is a story of curiosity, darkness, and the eternal dance of life and death. Prepare yourself for a journey into the heart of darkness, where the line between the living and the forgotten is as thin as a shadow. This is the story of Merlin's tomb, a tale that will chill you to the bone. The morning mist hung low over the Scottish moors, a blanket of white that veiled the ancient secrets lying beneath. Dr. Eliza McGregor, a renowned archaeologist, stood at the edge of the excavation site, her eyes fixed on the newly unearthed entrance of what she believed to be Merlin's tomb. Her red hair, as fiery as her spirit, was pulled back in a practical bun, and her hands, clad in dirt-stained gloves, rested on her hips confidently. Dr. McGregor, called out one of her assistants, are you sure about this? Eliza turned, her green eyes sparking with the thrill of the hunt. This is what we've been searching for, she replied with unwavering certainty. The locals, gathered at a safe distance, whispered among themselves. They spoke of the legend, a tale passed down through generations, about Merlin, a powerful druid whose spirit was said to guard his final resting place. They warned of curses and wrathful ghosts. But Eliza was not one to be swayed by superstitions. As she surveyed her team, preparing to enter the tomb, Eliza recalled the many voices that had tried to dissuade her from this quest. Colleagues had scoffed, calling it a myth, a wild goose chase. Funding was hard to come by, as most academic circles deemed her pursuit a fanciful waste of resources. But Eliza had never been one to tread the beaten path. She was a trailblazer, driven by a passion for uncovering the mysteries that history whispered. Her mind wandered back to her childhood, to the nights when her grandmother would tell her tales of the ancient Celts and their mystical druids. Even as a child, Eliza felt a deep connection to these stories, a sense that there was truth entwined within the myth. Merlin's legend had always fascinated her the most. While others doubted, Eliza felt an inexplicable certainty in her bones that the legend was real. I don't care about their doubts, Eliza had often said, her voice laced with determination. The only question is, who's going to stop me from finding it? Now standing at the threshold of a discovery that could change history, Eliza felt her heart race with excitement and a touch of fear. She knew that crossing into the tomb might unleash forces beyond her understanding, yet the call of the unknown was too strong to resist. Let's uncover the truth, she said, stepping forward into the shadowed entrance of the tomb. The air was cool and still, as if untouched by time. Eliza couldn't shake the feeling that eyes, unseen and ancient, were watching her every move. As the darkness of the tomb enveloped her, Eliza McGregor knew her life would never be the same again. The legend of Merlin, once a whisper in the wind, was now an echoing call in the depths of the earth, beckoning her forward. Ah, oh, my dear nocturnal scholars of the macabre, it's time for a quick scare break. As we linger in these shadowy realms, 
a small favour I dare to ask. If my tales of terror bring you thrills, do not let our journey end here. Hit like, subscribe, and join our dark congregation. Now shall we delve deeper into the abyss. Let's embrace the darkness once more. Let's get back to the shadows. The air grew colder as Dr. Eliza McGregor and her team descended into the depths of Merlin's tomb. The walls, etched with ancient Celtic symbols, seemed to pulse with a life of their own, the carvings illuminated by the beams of their flashlights. The passage narrowed, and the scent of earth and age filled their lungs. As they ventured deeper, the corridor opened into a large chamber. It was a living space, astonishingly preserved. The first thing that struck Eliza was the sense of recent occupation. A fire pit in the center of the room contained ashes that were not entirely cold. Beside it, a simple wooden table bore the marks of recent use. The wood surface, smoothed by hands and time. Look at this, one of her team members, Alex, whispered, pointing to a set of footprints in the dust. They were remarkably clear, as if made only days before. The team exchanged uneasy glances. The logical part of their minds knew no one could have been here for centuries, yet the evidence suggested otherwise. Eliza's heart raced as she moved towards a corner of the chamber where a collection of scrolls and ancient texts were carefully arranged on a stone shelf. Her fingers trembled as she picked up a scroll that seemed out of place among the ancient manuscripts. It was newer, the parchment less aged, the ink still dark and stark against the creamy background. Unrolling the scroll with a reverence befitting its possible historical value, Eliza's eyes widened in astonishment. The script was in an archaic form of garlic, but her years of study allowed her to decipher it. It was a druidic spell, one that purported to commune with the earth itself, to draw power and knowledge from the very soil and stone of the land. This, this can't be, she muttered, her voice barely above a whisper. The spell spoke of conversing with the spirits of the land, of drawing forth the wisdom of the ancients. It was a piece of living history, a direct connection to the practices and beliefs of a long gone era. The team crowded round, marveling at the find. The reality of their discovery was overwhelming. Not only had they uncovered the resting place of a legendary druid, but they had also stumbled upon what appeared to be recent activity, a mystery that defied explanation. Eliza felt a chill run down her spine as she pondered the implications. The legend of Merlin had always hinted at his mastery over life and death, his connection to the earth so profound that it transcended time. Could it be that the spirit of Merlin himself had been here, using this very scroll to commune with the world beyond? The chamber seemed to close in around them, the shadows stretching and twisting in the flickering light of their torches. A sense of being watched, of being not alone in the depths of the ancient tomb, crept over Eliza. The line between legend and reality was blurring, and she knew that they were on the cusp of something both incredible and terrifying. As they prepared to explore further, Eliza couldn't shake the feeling that they were delving into secrets that had been meant to remain hidden, secrets that might have been better left undisturbed. The weight of history pressed upon her, the whispers of the past echoing in the cold, still air of Merlin's tomb. The eerie silence of the tomb was shattered by a blood-curdling scream echoing through the ancient corridors. Dr. Eliza McGregor and her team froze, their hearts pounding in unison with the sudden rush of fear. Without a word, they turned and raced towards the source of the sound, their flashlights cutting through the oppressive darkness. They found James, one of the younger archaeologists, lying motionless on the cold stone floor of a narrow passageway. His eyes were wide open, staring blankly at the ceiling, his face ashen and lifeless. It was as though every ounce of life had been drained from his body, 
leaving behind a hollow shell. God, no! Eliza gasped, dropping to her knees beside him. She checked for a pulse, but there was none. His skin was cold to the touch, an unnatural chill that seemed to emanate from within. This is wrong. We shouldn't have come here, murmured Sarah, another colleague, her voice trembling with fear. Her eyes darted around the shadowy corridor, as if expecting something to emerge from the darkness. Eliza felt a cold knot of dread in her stomach. She had heard of curses and hauntings, but this was beyond anything she had imagined. It was as if the tomb itself had come alive, exacting revenge for their intrusion. We need to leave now, she said, her voice firm, despite the panic that threatened to overwhelm her. As the team hurried back towards the entrance, the ground beneath them suddenly shook violently. Dust and small stones rained down from the ceiling as they stumbled, trying to keep their balance. It was like an earthquake, localized and ferocious, centered right beneath their feet. When the shaking stopped, they reached the entrance, only to find it completely blocked. A massive pile of rocks and earth had collapsed sealing them inside. It was as if the tomb itself had conspired to trap them, burying the entrance under tons of Ol's earth and stone. No, this can't be happening, Alex shouted, his voice echoing off the walls in desperation. Before the they could react, another scream pierced the air. This time, it was Mark, another member of their team. They found him just as they had found James, lifeless, his vitality seemingly sucked away by an unseen force. Panic set in as the reality of their situation dawned on them. They were trapped with no way out, in a tomb that seemed to be alive with a malevolent force. The legend of Merlin, once a fascinating tale, had become a nightmarish reality. Eliza tried to maintain her composure, to think of a way to escape but the deaths of her colleagues weighed heavily on her. Whatever was in the tomb with them, it was powerful, ancient, and vengeful. They were not just archaeologists uncovering the past anymore. They were survivors, fighting against the darkness that threatened to consume them. As the team huddled together in the dim light of their torches, shadows around them seemed to move to whisper secrets of a long-forgotten past. The tomb of Merlin had become their prison, and they knew that their fight for survival had only just begun. The flickering light from their torches barely penetrated the oppressive darkness of the tomb. The team stood in a terrified huddle, their breaths coming in short, panicked gasps. Suddenly, without warning, Alex was violently pulled from their midst, his scream slicing through the stillness as he disappeared into the darkness. Alex! Eliza shouted, her voice laced with fear and desperation. Without hesitation, she and the rest of the team sprinted after him, their footsteps echoing ominously in the narrow passageways. The chase was a blur of shadows and fear. Alex's screams echoed around them, bouncing off the walls, disorienting them. They turned corner after corner, but each time they found nothing but empty corridors and the chilling silence of the tomb. Finally, the screaming stopped as abruptly as it had begun. They found Alex in a small chamber, his body lying twisted and lifeless on the ground, his eyes wide open in terror. Like James and Mark, his life force seemed to have been drained, leaving him a mere husk. Panic surged through the team. One by one, they began to fall prey to the unseen terror that lurked in the shadows. Michael was next, then Lisa. Each one pulled into the darkness, their screams a haunting echo in the ancient tomb. In the end, only Sarah and Eliza remained. They clung to each other, trembling, their minds struggling to comprehend the nightmare unfolding around them. The tomb had become a maze of death, its corridors a trap from which there seemed to be no escape. We can't stay here, Eliza whispered, her voice trembling. We need to find another way out. Sarah nodded, 
her face pale and her eyes wide with fear. They moved cautiously, their torches cast in long, dancing shadows on the walls. Every sound made them jump. Every whisper of wind felt like a ghostly touch. As they navigated the labyrinthine tomb, Eliza couldn't help but feel that they were being watched, that the spirit of Merlin, or something far more ancient and malevolent, was stalking them, playing a macabre game with their lives. The air grew colder, the darkness deeper. The sense of an impending doom hung over them like a shroud. They knew that their chances of survival were dwindling with each passing moment. Yet they pushed forward, driven by the primal instinct to survive. The tomb seemed to twist and turn around them, its corridors shifting, leading them in circles. Time lost meaning in the eternal night of the underground. Eliza and Sarah clung to the hope that there was still a way out, that they could escape the curse that had claimed their friends. But as the hours passed, and the darkness seemed to close in around them, that hope grew dimmer. The tomb of Merlin, with its ancient secrets and its vengeful spirits, had become their prison, and they knew that escaping its grasp would take more than courage and determination. It would take a miracle. The sudden, unexplained disappearance of Sarah left Eliza frozen in shock. One moment, Sarah was right beside her, and the next, she was gone, as if swallowed by the shadows themselves. There was no scream, no struggle, just an eerie silence that amplified Eliza's growing sense of dread. Eliza's flashlight flickered weakly, its dim light barely cutting through the oppressive blackness of the tomb. Each beam seemed to struggle against the darkness, as if the shadows themselves were alive, trying to smother the light. She called out Sarah's name, her voice echoing off the ancient stone walls, but there was no response, only the haunting silence of the tomb. With every passing second, the weight of her solitude pressed heavier on Eliza. The darkness around her felt alive, a tangible presence that seemed to breathe and move with malevolent intent. The air was cold and still, yet she felt as if unseen eyes were watching her. Following her every move, Eliza tried to move forward, her hands trembling as she clutched the flashlight. The beam darted across the walls, revealing cryptic carvings and ominous symbols that seemed to dance and shift in the flickering light. Her footsteps sounded unnaturally loud in the silence, each echo a reminder of her isolation. The tomb's corridors twisted and turned like a labyrinth, a maze designed not just to entomb the dead, but to confuse and entrap the living. Eliza's mind raced as she tried to remember the path they had taken, but the fear and the disorienting darkness made it impossible to think clearly. As she stumbled through the corridors, her mind was assaulted by terrifying visions. She saw faces in the shadows, twisted and contorted in silent screams, their eyes hollow and accusing. She heard whispers, voices that seemed to come from the very walls, speaking in a language that was ancient and unknowable. Eliza's heart pounded in her chest, her breath coming in short, panicked gasps. She felt a growing sense of despair, a realization that she might never find her way out, that the tomb would become her final resting place as well. Then, in the distance, she saw a faint glimmer of light, Hope surged through her, a desperate, clinging hope that there might be a way out. She quickened her pace, moving towards the light, her flashlight's beam dancing wildly as she ran. But as she drew closer, the light flickered and vanished, snuffed out by the overwhelming darkness. Eliza's heart sank. The realization hit her like a physical blow. The light was not an exit, but another trap. A cruel trick played by the tomb to lure her deeper into its depths. Alone, lost, and terrified, Eliza McGregor continued to wander through the darkness, each step taking her further into the heart of the ancient tomb, each moment bringing her closer to an unknown fate. 
The horror of her situation was all consuming, a nightmare from which there was no waking. The darkness was not just around her, it was inside her, a part of her, and she knew that it would never let her go. Eliza stumbled into a room that seemed untouched by time. In the center, illuminated by an eerie, ethereal light, sat an old man. His features were unnaturally aged, his skin like parchment, etched with the passage of centuries. He was dressed in a tattered robe, and before him lay ancient writing materials and scrolls. His hands moved with a slow, deliberate grace as he wrote. As Eliza's eyes adjusted to the dim light, she realized with a shock who this figure must be. Merlin, she whispered, her voice barely audible. At the sound of his name, the old man stopped writing and turned towards her. His eyes, deep and dark, held the weight of ages, and when he spoke, his voice was like the rustling of dry leaves. You know me? child of the modern age. Their brief exchange was interrupted by the emergence of Sarah, dressed in a druid's robe. The sight of her, so out of place in this ancient setting, sent a chill down Eliza's spine. Around Sarah's neck hung a talisman, glowing with a faint, otherworldly light. Sarah, what is this? Eliza asked, her voice tinged with disbelief and horror. Sarah's expression was one of cold triumph. Merlin is my prisoner, she declared, bound to me by this talisman. She lifted the glowing object slightly, and as she did, Merlin winced as if in pain. Eliza struggled to comprehend what she was hearing. But why? How? I was the one who tried to stop you from finding this place, Sarah confessed. I knew if you did. It could jeopardize everything I've worked for. I need Merlin, his knowledge, his power, and now I need you. A horrifying realization dawned on Eliza. The team, you were behind their deaths. Sarah's eyes gleamed with a dark intensity. Their life force keeps Merlin alive, strengthens the bond through the talisman. And now it's your turn. Your essence will be the final key. With it, I will unlock the full extent of Merlin's druidic magic. Eliza recoiled in terror, understanding the full extent of Sarah's betrayal. The deaths of her team, the traps in the tomb, it had all been orchestrated by Sarah to harness the ancient power of Merlin. Merlin, still seated, looked at Eliza with a gaze filled with sorrow and centuries of regret. I am sorry, child. Bound as I am, I am powerless to stop her. Eliza backed away, her mind racing for a way out, but Sarah advanced, the talisman glowing brighter. The room seemed to close in around them, the shadows stretching and twisting into grotesque shapes. You will join your team, Eliza, Sarah hissed. Your essence will be mine, and with it, the secrets of ages. Eliza's heart pounded in her chest, her breath coming in ragged gasps. She was trapped, with a madwoman wielding the power of an ancient sorcerer. The horror of her situation was overwhelming, a nightmarish reality from which there was no escape. As Sarah raised the talisman, its light pulsing like a living thing, Eliza knew she was facing her final moments. The betrayal, the ancient magic, the unyielding grip of the tomb, it all converged in a terrifying crescendo, sealing her fate in the depths of the cursed tomb. As Sarah advanced with the glowing talisman in hand, a surge of adrenaline coursed through Eliza. In a desperate, split-second decision, she lunged forward, grappling with Sarah. The talisman, the source of Sarah's power and Merlin's bondage, slipped from Sarah's grasp clattering to the stone floor. With a swift motion, driven by instinct and fear, Eliza kicked the talisman. It skittered across the floor and smashed against the wall, shattering into pieces. A blinding light erupted from the broken talisman, enveloping the room in a radiant glow. Merlin's form began to change. 
the centuries of age and confinement, fell away from him like shackles being broken. His eyes blazed with a fierce light, and power radiated from him in waves. The transformation was both awe-inspiring and terrifying. Sarah staggered back, her eyes wide with fear and disbelief. Merlin, now free from his bonds, turned towards her. His face was a mask of ancient wrath, a pent-up fury from centuries of imprisonment. With a gesture of his hand, he unleashed his power upon Sarah. It was a spectacle of elemental force, a torrent of fire and energy that seemed to consume her very essence. Sarah's screams were lost in the roar of the unleashed magic. Merlin then turned to Eliza, his eyes softening. You have freed me, child of the modern age, he said, his voice resonant with power. For that, you have my gratitude. But his freedom came with a price. The power that Merlin unleashed began to consume the tomb itself. Flames and arcane energies spiralled out of control, igniting the ancient stone and timbers. The tomb, Merlin's prison for centuries, was now ablaze, an inferno of magical fire. Merlin stood amidst the chaos, a smile of liberation on his face. The fire reflected in his eyes, but he seemed oblivious to the destruction around him, lost in the euphoria of his newfound freedom. Eliza, realizing the peril, turned to flee, but the flames were spreading too fast, consuming everything in their path. The heat was intense, the smoke suffocating. She coughed and stumbled, her eyes stinging as she tried to find a way out, but there was no escape. The fire was everywhere a raging beast that devoured the tomb and its secrets. Eliza's last thoughts were of despair and resignation, realizing that her quest for knowledge had led to this tragic end. Merlin, still standing amidst the flames, remained untouched by the fire. His smile never wavered as the blaze engulfed the entire tomb, sealing its secrets and its occupants in a fiery tomb. The ancient sorcerer, finally free, was indifferent to the destruction around him, consumed by the joy of his liberation. The tomb of Merlin, along with its mysteries and its tragic final chapter, was lost to the flames, a forgotten relic of a bygone era, consumed by the fires of ancient magic. Years had passed since the tragic events in the tomb of Merlin, the moors of Scotland, ever shifting and mysterious, had reclaimed the land, obscuring the secrets that lay buried beneath. A new team of archaeologists, led by a determined and ambitious young man named Dr. Ian Campbell, had been drawn to the area by tales of undiscovered ancient sites. Equipped with modern technology and driven by the lure of historical discovery, they scoured the moors following old maps and legends. One misty morning, as the sun struggled to pierce the dense fog, Dr. Campbell's team stumbled upon an anomaly in the landscape. The ground here was uneven, and there were signs of a collapse, a caving in that suggested an underground structure. Excitement buzzed through the team as they cleared away earth and debris. Hours of painstaking work revealed a stone entrance, partially collapsed, but unmistakably man-made. The thrill of discovery was palpable among the team members. Dr. Campbell, standing at the threshold of the entrance, felt a chill run down his spine. Despite the ruinous state of the entryway, there was a sense of foreboding, an aura of mystery and danger that seemed to seep from the very stones. He turned to his team, his eyes alight with the thrill of potential discovery. This is it, he said his voice barely more than a whisper, a mix of awe and apprehension. As his words echoed faintly in the cool air, the team gathered around the entrance, unaware of the tomb's tragic history and the secrets it still held. The story of Eliza McGregor and her team had faded into obscurity, a forgotten chapter in the annals of archeological inexploration. Dr. Campbell took a step forward ready to lead his team into the depths of the earth. 
the entrance to Merlin's tomb, once again uncovered, awaited them, its secrets shrouded in darkness and silence. The chapter ended there, leaving the fate of Dr. Campbell and his team a mystery, a new beginning at the cusp of an ancient tale. The legacy of the tomb, with its dark past and hidden power, lingered in the air, a silent sentinel to the cycles of curiosity and ambition that drive humankind in its ceaseless quest for knowledge. When a group of friends venture into the eerie depths of Thetford Forest, they capture something unimaginable on camera, a glimpse of a strange, elusive creature. But when they return home, their lives take a terrifying turn. One by one, they begin to disappear, vanishing without a trace. Haunted by the memories of the forest and the creature they encountered, the remaining friends must confront their darkest fears. As they come face to face with the unknown, a chilling question emerges. Could this sinister being be the legendary Wendigo? The late afternoon sun dappled through the thick canopy of Thetford Forest, casting a warm, golden hue over the sprawling woods. Emma and James, a couple from the nearby town of Brandon, were enjoying a leisurely walk with their spirited spaniel, Max. They often came to the forest to escape the bustle of everyday life, finding solace in its serene beauty. Lost in conversation and laughter, they barely noticed the sun dipping below the horizon. The forest, a familiar haven in daylight, began to transform as shadows lengthened and an eerie stillness settled in. Max, usually energetic and curious, started to whine and stick close to their heels. It's getting late, we should head back, Emma said, a hint of unease in her voice. She glanced at her watch and was surprised to see it was much later than she had thought. As they turned to retrace their steps, a sudden rustling from the underbrush startled them. Max barked furiously, his hackles raised. James squinted into the trees, trying to discern the cause of the disturbance. That's when he saw it, a fleeting glimpse of a figure, too tall and too strange to be human, vanishing behind a thick cluster of trees. It had the unmistakable silhouette of a man, but with the head and antlers of a deer. Did you see that? He whispered to Emma, his voice laced with disbelief. Before she could answer, another rustle echoed through the forest, closer this time. They could feel the presence of something watching, something ancient and unfathomable. Panic surged through them as they realized they were not alone. Let's get out of here, Emma said, her voice trembling. They quickened their pace, every snap, twig and whisper of wind amplifying their fear. Max barked incessantly as if urging them to hurry. The forest seemed endless and for a terrifying moment, they feared they had lost their way. But eventually, the familiar path emerged, leading them to the safety of their car. They didn't stop to catch their breath until they were well on their way home. The forest, a dark silhouette in the rear view mirror. The next day, still shaken, they shared their experience with a local reporter. Their tale, tinged with the unbelievable but sincere in its fear, made the front page of the local newspaper and was shared extensively online. The headline read, Mysterious creature spotted in Thetford Forest, a legend returns. The story reignited interest in the old legend of the forest, drawing both skeptics and believers into a debate that would soon captivate the entire region. The story of Emma and James's encounter in Thetford Forest spread like wildfire, igniting a mixture of skepticism and fascination among the locals. Among them were three friends, Alex, Mia and Ben, known for their love of adventure and their small YouTube channel dedicated to exploring urban legends. Seeing an opportunity to make a name for themselves, they decided to investigate the forest. Armed with cameras, night vision goggles, 
and an unshakable sense of excitement, they ventured into the dense woods as dusk fell. The exact spot where the creature was reportedly seen became their base. They set up cameras in strategic locations, hoping to capture undeniable proof of the creature's existence. The night on, in the forest was an eerie experience. The usual sounds of the wilderness were amplified in the darkness, making every rustle and snap sound ominous. Several times, they thought they saw shadows moving in the distance, but it turned out to be nothing more than the wind stirring the trees. Hours passed without any significant incident and a sense of disappointment began to settle in. As dawn approached, they decided to pack up, feeling a mix of exhaustion and disillusionment. They had hoped for a clear sighting, a definitive proof, but the forest remained a silent, impenetrable mystery. Back at Alex's house, they reviewed the footage from the cameras. Most of it showed the quiet forest at night, nothing more. But then, on one of the cameras, they saw something that made their hearts race. It was a grainy and out of focus image, but there was a distinct figure resembling the creature with antlers silhouetted against the night. Their excitement was palpable. This was it, their moment of glory, their ticket to fame. They hastily prepared the footage and took it to the local newspaper, confident that they were about to make headlines. The newspaper editor, a seasoned journalist named Mr. Thompson, examined the footage with a critical eye. After a long pause, he looked up, his expression one of skepticism. This could be anything, he said dismissively. It's too grainy, too out of focus. For all we know, this could be someone wearing a mask, a prank. I can't publish this as evidence of a mythical creature. Trio's spirits plummeted. They had been so sure of their success, only to have their hopes dashed by the blunt assessment of the editor. The realization hit them hard. Capturing proof of the unknown was not going to be as easy as they had thought. But as they left the newspaper office, a new determination settled among them. They would return to the forest, better prepared this time to uncover the truth, no matter how elusive it might be. After the deflating visit to the newspaper office, Alex, me and Ben returned to their respective homes, each nurse in a sense of disappointment and frustration. Alex slumped onto his sofa, feeling particularly disheartened. He switched on his Xbox, trying to distract himself with video games, but as he played, something strange began to happen. In the game, he couldn't shake the feeling that some of the characters bore an uncanny resemblance to the figure they had captured on camera in Thetford Forest. He tried to dismiss it as his imagination, fueled by the day's events, but the nagging thought persisted. Switching off the console in annoyance, Alex decided to watch a movie instead, hoping to clear his mind. However, the same eerie sensation followed him. Throughout the movie, he kept seeing figures that reminded him of the creature, fleeting shadows in the background that seemed to mirror the antlered silhouette. This was more than a coincidence. It felt like a message, an invitation. Suddenly, Alex felt an irresistible urge to return to the forest. It was as if a magnetic pull, inexplicable and unyielding, was drawing him there. Without a second thought, he grabbed his coat and headed out, leaving his front door wide open in his haste. The next day, Maya and Ben tried to contact Alex but received no response. Concerned, they drove to his house, only to find his car missing and the front door ajar. A quick search of the house revealed nothing. It was as if Alex had left in a hurry. After three anxious days with no word from Alex, they reported him missing to the police. The authorities initiated a search and soon found Alex's car parked at Thetford Forest. The doors open, but no sign of Alex. The vehicle looked abandoned, as if he had left in a hurry or been taken abruptly. The news of Alex's disappearance spread quickly 
are reigniting the mysterious aura surrounding Thetford Forest. As the police combed the area, me and Ben grappled with guilt and fear, wondering if their quest for fame had led their friend into peril. The forest, once a place of wonder and intrigue, now loomed as a sinister enigma, hiding secrets that perhaps were never meant to be uncovered. Mia, overwhelmed by the disappearance of her friend Alex, retreated into the confines of her flat. She sought solace in solitude, a bottle of wine her only companion, as she tried to drown the growing sense of dread. Soft, relaxing music played in the background, a stark contrast to the turmoil in her mind. As she sat there, lost in thought, a sudden movement outside her window caught her eye. For a brief second, she thought she saw antlers passing by. Her heart raced. It couldn't be. She was in the middle of the city. She shook her head, attributing it to the wine and her stressed state of mind. But then, the music changed. The soothing melodies were replaced by sounds that chilled her to the bone. The clashing of antlers, as if two deer were locked in combat. Mia sat up, her eyes wide with confusion and fear. What's going on? She muttered to herself, feeling an eerie sense of being watched. The strange occurrences didn't stop there. Her lights flickered without reason, and the temperature in the room dropped suddenly, leaving her breath visible in the air. She heard whispers, indistinct yet unmistakably human, emanating from the corners of her flat. Each bizarre event further frayed her nerves, heightening her sense of unease. Then, just as it had with Alex, an irresistible urge overtook her. A compelling, powerful pull towards Thetford Forest. It was an inexplicable longing, a core that resonated with something deep within her. Resistance seemed futile. The desire to go to the forest consumed her every thought. In a trance-like state, Mia left her flat. She didn't bother to close the door or take her belongings. The need to go to the forest was all-encompassing, drowning out any sense of reason or fear. Mia's journey to Thetford Forest remained shrouded in mystery. Her friends and family searched for her. The police launched an extensive investigation, but no trace of her was ever found. Like Alex, she had vanished without a trace, swallowed by the enigmatic depths of the forest. Her disappearance added another layer to the growing legend of the forest and its mysterious creature. The once peaceful woodland now stood as a symbol of unexplained phenomena, a place where the boundary between myth and reality was perilously thin. The stories of those who were drawn to the forest and never returned continued to haunt the local community, a chilling reminder of the mysteries that lie hidden in the shadows of Thetford Forest. Ben, the last of the trio, found himself grappling with the unsettling disappearances of his friends. He approached the police, desperate for answers, but their insights only deepened the mystery. According to the authorities, both Alex and Mia had left their homes as if in a trance, abandoning everything behind them. This detail echoed the stories of the creature they had been chasing, adding a chilling layer to the unfolding events. Determined to uncover the truth, Ben turned to the internet for research. Time and again, his searches led him to a single haunting entity, the Wendigo. Traditionally, this creature was associated with the folklore of Algonquian-speaking peoples in North America, not England. The Wendigo was said to be a malevolent, cannibalistic spirit that could possess humans, especially those guilty of taboo activities like cannibalism. But why would a Wendigo be in Thetford Forest, thousands of miles from its cultural origins? Ben delved deeper into the myth and discovered a possible link. Centuries ago, during periods of colonization and exploration, cultural exchanges between different parts of the world were not uncommon. It was conceivable that settlers or explorers from North America brought the Wendigo myth to England, where it merged with local folklore. 
possibly explaining the creature resembling a man with a deer's head and antlers. The more Ben read, the more he realized the possible connection between the pursuit of the creature and the disappearances of Alex and Mia. According to legend, the Wendigo was not just a predator, but also a trickster, capable of luring its victims through mimicry and illusions. Perhaps by attempting to capture its image, they had unknowingly marked themselves as targets, drawing the Wendigo's attention. Fearful that he might be next, Ben took extreme measures. He remembered reading that Wendigos could influence the minds of their victims, compelling them to wander into the wilderness. To prevent himself from succumbing to a similar fate, Ben decided to tie himself to his bed each night. He hoped this physical restraint would prevent any unconscious, compelled journey towards the forest and the waiting Wendigo. Night after night, Ben lay in his bed, bound by ropes, his mind racing with fear and questions. The silence of his room was a stark contrast to the howling winds outside, a reminder of the unseen horrors that might be lurking in the darkness. As he drifted into a restless sleep, he couldn't shake the feeling that the Wendigo was out there somewhere, waiting for its next victim to surrender to its call. As night enveloped the world outside, Ben lay in his bed, his legs securely tied to the bedpost. The rope was his lifeline, a safeguard against the inexplicable pull towards Thetford Forest. He had hoped the bindings would grant him peace, but instead, a relentless, overwhelming urge gripped him. It was an instinctual, primal call, stronger than any he had ever experienced, driving him towards the forest with a desperate intensity. Ben struggled against the cord, his rational mind losing ground to the compelling force. He reached the edge of his room, but the rope held him back. In a frenzy, he clawed at the floor, tears streaming down his face, his throat emitting involuntary howls. The struggle was futile, the rope was unyielding, his physical strength no match for the cord that anchored him to reality. Exhausted and defeated, Ben collapsed on the floor. His fingers were raw and bleeding from scratching at the wooden planks, his knees bruised and aching, but he was safe, at least for the moment. Then, as he lay there, panting and disoriented, he turned his gaze to the window. There, in the moonlight, stood the creature, its form silhouetted against the night sky. The antlers, the stature, the very essence of the entity they had sought was there. Staring into his room, its breath was heavy, reminiscent of a stag preparing for a fight, its head lowering as if in a pre-attack posture. The creature's eyes, dark and piercing, locked onto Ben's. Frozen with terror, Ben screamed. The sound seemed to break the spell, and in an instant, the creature vanished, as if it had never been there. Left in a state of shock, Ben huddled in the corner of his room, waiting for dawn, too afraid to move, too afraid to sleep. As morning light filtered through the curtains, Ben's fear gradually gave way to determination. He knew what he had to do. He would go to Thetford Forest in the daylight. Perhaps in the safety of the sun, he could uncover some answers, find some clue as to what had happened to his friends, and understand the nature of the creature that haunted them. With a plan in mind, Ben untied himself, treated his wounds, and prepared for the journey. He armed himself with a camera, a map, and a resolve to face the unknown. As he stepped out of his house, the morning sun casting long shadows on the ground, Ben knew he was walking into the heart of the mystery that had consumed their lives. Whether he would find answers or succumb to the same fate as his friends remained to be seen, but he was determined to confront whatever lay hidden in the depths of Thetford Forest, and stepped into the heart of Thetford Forest with a mixture of fear and resolve. The area was eerily quiet, the only sound being the crunch of leaves under his feet. He made his way to the site where they had captured the image of the creature, his eyes scanning the forest around him. What do you want? 
he shouted into the trees, his voice echoing through the stillness. He half expected no answer, but what happened next was beyond his wildest fears. A rustle in the underbrush caught his attention, and he turned to see a deer standing there, its eyes fixed on him. Another deer joined it, and then another, until a group of deer all stood in a semicircle around him, their gaze unblinking, unnaturally still. Ben's heart pounded in his chest. This was not normal behavior for deer. Something else was at play. If then, from behind the group of deer, a massive stag emerged. It was a magnificent creature with terrifyingly large antlers. It locked eyes with Ben and began to slam its hooves into the dirt, snorting loudly through its nostrils. Ben's instinct screamed for him to run, but he knew that if he turned his back, the stag, or whatever it was, would easily catch him. Frozen in place, Ben watched in horror as the stag began to change. It reared up on its hind legs, its form twisting and morphing. Before his eyes, the stag transformed into the creature they had been seeking, the man with the head of a deer and massive antlers. At that moment, a couple walking their dog in a distant part of the forest heard a blood-curdling scream. It was a sound so filled with terror and despair that it would haunt them for the rest of their lives. Ben was never seen again. His disappearance added another tragic chapter to the legend of Thetford Forest. The creature, the man-deer, became a tale whispered in hushed tones, a warning of the unexplainable and unknown dangers lurking in the shadows of the forest. The mystery of what truly happened to Ben, Alex and Mia remained unsolved, leaving a lingering sense of unease and fear among the locals. Thetford Forest, with its deep woods and ancient secrets, continued to be a place of both fascination and dread. A reminder that some mysteries are perhaps best left unexplored. In the aftermath of the disappearances in Thetford Forest, a heavy shroud of mystery and fear hung over the local community. The legend of the creature, now widely associated with the Wendigo, it became a topic of hushed, anxious discussion. But why did this entity take the lives of those who sought its secrets? The answer lay deep within the ancient lore and the very nature of the Wendigo itself. The Wendigo, as understood in the original Algonquian folklore, was not just a creature of physical threat. It was a spiritual entity, a guardian of the natural world and its sacred mysteries. It was believed that the Wendigo protected certain places and knowledge that were not meant for human understanding or interference. These were secrets deeply intertwined with the fabric of the natural world, holding powers and truths beyond human comprehension. When Alex, Mia and Ben attempted to capture the image of the creature and unveil its mystery to the world, they unknowingly crossed a forbidden threshold. They pried into secrets that were guarded by the Wendigo, challenging the balance that the entity was bound to protect. The forest, a place of ancient magic and untold stories, was under the Wendigo's watch and it had its own way of maintaining the sanctity of its hidden truths. The manifestation of the Wendigo in Thetford Forest, far from its cultural origins, suggested that such entities were not bound by geography, but by purpose. They were the protectors of the unseen and the unknown, existing wherever the balance between the natural world and its deeper secrets was threatened. The Wendigo's actions were not acts of malice, but of necessity, dictated by the ancient laws that governed it. By taking the lives of those who sought to expose its secrets, the Wendigo was not only protecting the sanctity of the unknown, but also serving as a warning to others. It was a reminder that some mysteries are intrinsic to the natural world, and that the pursuit of these forbidden truths could have dire consequences. In the end, the legend of the Wendigo in Thetford Forest became a tale of caution, 
a sombre narrative about the boundaries between the known and the unknown and the price of transgressing those boundaries. The forest remained a place of awe and mystery, a reminder of the enduring power and secrets of the natural world and the ancient guardians who protect them. It's time for a quick scare break. As we linger in these shadowy realms, a small favour I dare to ask. If my tales of terror bring you thrills, do not let our journey end here. Hit like, subscribe and join our dark congregation. How would you feel about exclusive content that you can't find anywhere else? Imagine diving into unique stories, crafted just for you, and getting a sneak peek with behind the scenes videos that bring you closer to the creative process. All you need to do is click the join button below. By becoming a member, you'll unlock a world of exclusive content and experiences and be a part of shaping the future of our channel. Now shall we delve deeper into the abyss. Let's embrace the darkness once more. Let's get back to the shadows. In the heart of a storm, urban explorer Nathan stumbles upon Mannequin Alley, a ghost town where time stands still and mannequins outnumber the living. Each step he takes unravels a deeper, darker mystery as the lifeless figures seem to watch and follow. Trapped in this eerie, silent world, Nathan's reality blurs, challenged by the unblinking eyes of the mannequins. Are they just figures or something more sinister? As Nathan fights to escape, he discovers a chilling truth that will leave you questioning what is real and what is merely a mannequin's dream. Welcome to Mannequin Alley, where the line between the living and the lifeless is terrifyingly blurred. Chapter 1 Arrival in Silence The storm had been relentless, pounding against the windshield like a barrage of unending fury. Nathan, gripping the steering wheel of his old jeep, squinted through the rain-blurred glass. He was an urban explorer by passion, a wanderer who thrived on uncovering the forgotten corners of the world. Tonight, however, his adventure was driven more by necessity than desire. The storm had forced him off the main road, leading him down a labyrinth of forgotten back roads. As the rain finally began to relent, Nathan noticed a faded wooden sign, barely legible under the dim glow of his headlights. Welcome to Mannequin Alley. The name sent a shiver down his spine, not out of fear, but intrigue. An abandoned town, perhaps. Perfect for exploration once the storm passed. Driving into the heart of the town, he was struck by the profound silence. It was as if life itself had decided to give this place a wide berth. The buildings, though intact, bore the unmistakable signs of long-term neglect, peeling paint, boarded windows and doors ajar, swinging gently in the post-storm breeze. Parking his jeep near what looked like the town square, Nathan grabbed his flashlight and camera. The place was eerily still, the only sound his boots crunching on the gravel. It was then he saw it, a lone mannequin, positioned in the window of what once might have been a boutique. Its face was expressionless, its gaze fixed on some distant point. For a moment, Nathan felt as if it was watching him, but he shook off the feeling with a chuckle. Just a mannequin, he muttered to himself. As he walked through the desolate streets, Nathan's sense of unease grew. The town was not just abandoned, it was as if it had been frozen in time. Storefronts displayed outdated fashions. A diner had its menu still chalked on a board, prices dating back decades. There were no cars, no signs of recent human activity. It was a ghost town in the truest sense. Intrigued by the absolute absence of life, Nathan decided to document his findings. He began taking pictures, the flash of his camera 
momentarily illuminating the forgotten corners of Mannequin Alley. He planned to explore more, to unravel the mystery of this place. Little did he know, as night began to fall and shadows grew longer, that the mystery was far deeper and more unsettling than any forgotten town he had ever encountered. Mannequin Alley was not just a relic of the past, it was a place where past and present intertwined in an eerie, silent dance. As the last light of day faded, Nathan felt the first prickle of real fear. There was something about this town, something that whispered of secrets best left undiscovered, but curiosity, as always, got the better of him. He ventured deeper into the heart of Manaquin Alley, unaware of the eyes that seemed to follow him from the shadows. Chapter 2 The Silent Watchers It's time for a quick scare break. As we linger in these shadowy realms, a small favour I dare to ask. If my tales of terror bring you thrills, do not let our journey end here. Hit like, subscribe and join our dark congregation. Now shall we delve deeper into the abyss. Let's embrace the darkness once more. Let's get back to the shadows. Nathan's stomach growled, a stark reminder that his impromptu detour had extended well past dinner. The stores, preserved in a bygone era, beckoned. He stepped into what appeared to be a quaint old-fashioned general store. The shelves were surprisingly well stocked with canned goods and non-perishables. Guess it won't hurt to borrow a bit, he mused, selecting a few items. The stillness of the shop was unnerving. Each sound he made seemed amplified in the silence. After a makeshift meal of canned beans and a stale but edible loaf of bread, he felt revitalized. Curiosity nudged him further, leading him to explore a few more shops. Each was as abandoned as the last, filled with relics of a time long past. He helped himself to a flashlight with better batteries and a warmer jacket from an old clothing store. Stepping back into the street, Nathan's heart leaped into his throat. There, at the end of the street, stood what he thought was a person. Relief washed over him, accompanied by a flurry of questions. Hey, he shouted, jogging towards the figure. I thought I was the only one here. As he got closer, the shape resolved itself, not into a person, but another mannequin. This one was dressed in faded, elegant dress, its face locked in an eternal, blank stare. Nathan laughed nervously, running a hand through his hair. You got me good, he said to the mannequin, trying to shake off the eerie feeling. Thought you were real for a second there. But as he turned to leave, a prickling sense of unease crept up his spine. He didn't remember seeing this mannequin earlier, frowning. He checked the photos on his camera. Sure enough, the street had been empty before. No sign of the womanly figure that now stood silently watching him. Hello? Nathan's voice echoed down the empty street. Who's there? Who moved this mannequin? He spun around, scanning the quiet town. That's when he saw it. Another figure. This one standing in the doorway of the shop he had just exited. Heart pounding, he approached, only to find another mannequin, this time a man in a suit, its blank eyes seeming to stare right through him. Who's doing this? Nathan screamed into the void, his voice a mix of fear and frustration. The silence that answered him was complete, oppressive. He looked around wildly, half expecting to catch a glimpse of someone or something moving in the shadows. But there was nothing, just the mannequins, the silent witnesses to his growing dread, standing as if they had always been there, watching, waiting in the stillness of Mannequin Alley. Nathan shivered, not just from the cold, but from a creeping realization that he was not alone in this abandoned town. Someone, or something, was toying with him. Chapter 3 Echoes in the Hall Nathan's heart was racing as he spun back towards the woman mannequin. But now, 
she wasn't alone. Two more mannequins stood up beside her, one dressed as a baker, complete with a dusting of flour on his apron, and the other a child holding a ragged doll. What the hell? Nathan muttered under his breath, a cold shiver running down his spine. He walked, almost stumbled through the streets, his shouts for answers echoing off the silent buildings. Hello, I know someone's here. His voice was tinged with desperation. Who is it? Who's doing this? But the only answer was the hollow echo of his own voice. Then, faintly at first, he heard it. Voices. They were coming from the town hall, a grand old building that loomed at the end of the main street. The sound was like a distant meeting, a murmur of conversation and debate. Hope surged in Nathan. People. Finally, people. He ran towards the town hall, the voices growing louder with each step. Bursting through the doors, he expected to find a room full of people, but the hall was empty. The voices cutting off abruptly as if someone had flipped a switch. The chairs were unoccupied, the stage bare. Confusion swirled in his mind. Turning to leave, feeling a mix of frustration and unease, Nathan stepped out of the town hall. The moment his back was turned, the voices started again. Whipping around, he was met with a sight that froze him in his tracks. The once empty chairs were now filled with mannequins, each dressed in different attire, sitting as if in attendance of an important meeting. The voices stopped instantly, the silence deafening. Who's doing this? Nathan screamed, his voice cracking. He scanned the mannequins, looking for any sign of life, any hint of who might be orchestrating this macabre display. But their faces were blank, their eyes empty. They were just... mannequins. This was more than just an abandoned town. It was a psychological maze, a place where the lines between reality and illusion blurred. Nathan felt his grip on sanity wavering as the eerie silence of Mannequin Alley pressed in on him. The mannequins, with their unseeing eyes and silent forms, seemed to mock his desperation, his fear. Nathan backed out of the town hall slowly, his eyes never leaving the mannequins. As he stepped into the street, the weight of isolation and the surreal nature of his situation crashed down on him. He was alone, yet not alone. Watched, but by whom? Or what? The whispers of the past, the echoes of a life that once was, hung in the air. And Nathan, caught in the heart of this unnerving symphony, began to question his own reality. Was he the intruder here? Or was he becoming a part of Mannequin Alley's mysterious silent world? Chapter 4 The Invisible Cage Nathan's breath came in ragged gasps as he turned around, his heart pounding against his chest. The transformation was complete. The town was now teeming with mannequins. They lined the streets, filled the benches, and crowded the windows of shops. Each was dressed distinctly, capturing a moment in time. A postman, mid-stride with a bag of letters, a group of children playing hopscotch, an elderly couple seated on a park bench, their hands frozen inches apart. The town, once desolate and silent, now mimicked a bustling community, but not with people, with mannequins. It was a macabre parody of life, each figure positioned in a tableau of everyday normalcy. The sun cast long shadows over the scene, creating an eerie contrast of light and dark, life and lifelessness. Panic clawed at Nathan's mind. He turned and ran, his only thought to escape this surreal nightmare. The streets blurred past him as he sprinted towards the edge of town, towards the exit road he had driven in on. But as he reached the town's boundary, his body slammed against an invisible barrier. It was like hitting a wall of solid air, impenetrable and unyielding. Stunned, Nathan fell back onto the ground. He pushed against the barrier with his hands, but it was like pushing against a mountain. The barrier was clear, yet it distorted the view like a heat haze, 
creating a surreal boundary that caged him within the town. The realization that he was trapped, truly trapped, hit Nathan like a physical blow. His mind raced, teetering on the edge of panic. Was this some kind of elaborate prank? A government experiment? His thoughts spiraled, grappling for any logical explanation, but logic seemed to have abandoned this place. Nathan's breathing became shallow, his eyes darting frantically. The psychological impact was immense. He felt like a specimen under a microscope, observed by unseen eyes. The mannequins, with their lifeless stares, seemed to be the audience to his unraveling. He tried to think, to piece together the puzzle. The town, the mannequins, the invisible barrier. What did it all mean? Was he being punished? Or tested? The question spun in his head, each more unanswerable than the last. Desperate for answers, Nathan retraced his steps, his gaze flitting between the unmoving figures that populated the town. He started searching for any clue, any sign that might explain his surreal imprisonment. Every shadow, every creak of the old buildings set his nerves on edge. The town was a labyrinth, its secrets cloaked in silence and shadows. As night began to fall, the town took on a more sinister aspect. The mannequins, bathed in the pale moonlight, cast long, grotesque shadows. The line between reality and madness blurred as Nathan's fear morphed into a deep, unsettling dread. He was alone, yet surrounded, trapped in a town that was both familiar and utterly alien. In Manaqueen Alley, under the uncaring gaze of a hundred frozen eyes, Nathan faced not only the mystery of the town, but also the darker corners of his own mind. The barrier was not just around the town, it was closing in on his sanity, challenging his perception of reality itself. Chapter 5 The Silent Pursuit Nathan's heart sank as he made his way back into the heart of Manakin Alley. The scene before him was like a chilling tableau from a nightmare. Every mannequin, previously engaged in their mimicry of daily life, now stood motionless. All of them turned towards him. Their faces, devoid of expression, seemed to watch him with an eerie intensity. The sight sent a shiver down his spine, a visceral reminder that he was not just trapped, but also the focus of something inexplicable. He manoeuvred his way through the frozen crowd, their unblinking eyes following his every move. Seeking a brief respite, Nathan entered a bar, hoping the familiar surroundings would offer some comfort. Inside, he poured himself a stiff drink, the liquid burning its way down his throat, providing a fleeting warmth in the cold, silent bar. But as he glanced outside the window, his temporary relief shattered. The mannequins had moved closer, their faces pressed against the glass, eyes fixed on his location. A cold dread gripped him. Were they following him, tracking his every move? Peering further out, Nathan's breath caught in his throat. Every mannequin in town seemed to have turned towards the bar, hundreds of them, a silent, motionless army. The absurdity of the situation battled with the creeping terror in his mind. Desperate eh, for a semblance of safety, Nathan hurried up the stairs of the bar. Reaching the top, he dared a glance downwards. His heart raced at the sight. A few mannequins had infiltrated the bar, standing motionless at the foot of the stairs, as if waiting. He entered an upstairs room, which offered a panoramic view of the town. The scene outside was surreal. The mannequins had congregated around the bar, packed tightly, like a crowd trying to push their way inside. Nathan felt his sanity fraying at the edges, the relentless silence of the mannequins weighing heavily on him. Then, a noise, a subtle, almost imperceptible sound. Nathan cautiously opened the door to the hallway. On the stairs now stood two mannequins, their presence a silent threat. Looking back into the bar, he saw it was now filled with mannequins, standing shoulder to shoulder, a frozen audience to his plight. 
panic surged through Nathan. His breathing became erratic, his thoughts a whirlwind of fear and confusion. The line between reality and delusion blurred as he struggled to comprehend the surreal nightmare unfolding around him. The mannequins, with their blank stares and silent forms, seemed to be closing in, suffocating him with their presence. Nathan was trapped, not just physically, by the invisible barrier surrounding the town, but mentally, in a maze of fear and paranoia. The psychological torment of being the sole living being in a town overrun by these silent, watching figures was overwhelming. Every creak of the old building, every shift of shadow made him jump. He felt eyes on him constantly. The mannequins, a silent, ever-present audience to his unraveling sanity. In that room, overlooking the town of Mannequin Alley, Nathan faced the terrifying realization that his escape was not just a matter of finding a way out of the town, but also a battle against the encroaching shadows of madness. The mannequins, a relentless, unspoken menace, seemed to be a manifestation of his deepest fears, a silent judgment on his solitary existence. Nathan's hands trembled as he closed the door, his back pressing against it, as if he could reinforce it with his body alone. The room felt like a tiny island of sanity in a sea of madness. His heart pounded in his chest, a stark contrast to the oppressive silence of the mannequins outside. Then, the banging started. It was rhythmic, persistent, a dull thud against the wooden door. No, go away, Nathan yelled, his voice cracking with fear. The sound seemed to reverberate through the room, a stark intrusion into the eerie quiet. He forced himself to look out of the window again. The mannequins were still there, an army of silent watchers. Some had their lifeless eyes fixed on his window, others pressed against the entrance of the bar, their postures frozen mid-action. It was like a photograph capturing a moment in time, yet Nathan couldn't shake the feeling that they were anything but static. He dared not blink, fearing that in the split second of darkness, they might move, inch closer without him seeing. The banging on the door grew louder, more insistent, it echoed in Nathan's mind, each thud a hammer blow to his fray insanity. The room felt like it was closing in on him, the walls whispering secrets in a language he couldn't understand. The mannequins, with their blank faces and unblinking eyes, seemed to be chipping away at his mind, their presence a constant, unrelenting pressure. In a moment of desperate courage or madness, Nathan couldn't stand it any longer. He lunged for the door, throwing it open. His action was met with an avalanche of mannequins tumbling in, an unending cascade of lifeless bodies. They fell upon him, burying him under their weight. The last thing Nathan saw before darkness enveloped him was the blank, emotionless face of a mannequin, its eyes void of life, yet seemingly staring right into his soul. The chapter ends with Nathan lost under a heap of mannequins, their cold, unyielding forms a physical manifestation of the psychological terror that had gripped him since his arrival in Mannequin Alley. The darkness around him is complete, a fitting metaphor for the descent into the abyss of his own mind where reality and nightmare have become indistinguishable. Final chapter dreams of another life. In a bustling store in the heart of a large city, a young woman was busy setting up the latest display in the window. With practiced ease, she positioned the newest addition, a mannequin with strikingly lifelike features. It was the image of Nathan, standing motionless, gazing out into the busy street. There, all done, she said, stepping back to admire her work. The mannequin, dressed in the latest fashion, added a certain allure to the display. Her colleague, who had been arranging the attire on another mannequin, glanced over. Looks great. They're almost lifelike, aren't they? The woman nodded, her eyes still on the mannequin. You know, 
I often wonder if these mannequins sometimes have dreams of their own. Wonder what they would dream about if they could dream about being human. Her colleague laughed softly. That would be something, wouldn't it? Maybe even dreaming about trying to escape from being a mannequin. But then, I guess all the other mannequins wouldn't be too happy about that. Yeah, the woman continued, her gaze thoughtful. They'd have to now do its work. It's funny to think about, isn't it? A mannequin wanting to be something more, uh, living a life beyond these glass walls. The Nathan mannequin stood silent, an eternal observer to the world it could never partake in. Its eyes, though devoid of life, seemed to hold a depth, a hint of longing for something beyond its static existence. In that store window, the mannequin that was Nathan stood as a silent testament to the dreams and aspirations that might dwell within the inanimate. It was a reminder of the thin line between reality and fantasy, where sometimes, just maybe, the unreal dared to dream of being something more. As the women continued their work, unaware of the deeper narrative they had unwittingly touched upon, the Nathan mannequin remained still, a silent guardian of a dream that for one brief, surreal moment, in a town called Mannequin Alley, felt almost real. In the heart of the English countryside, where the mist clung to ancient oaks and the moon cast eerie shadows upon the sprawling manor, lived a tale that whispered through the corridors like a chilling breeze. The Hawthorn Manor, known for its dark secrets and storied past, harboured a twisted spectre, the screaming skull, a harbinger of dread that foretold a macabre truth. Emily, a radiant and unsuspecting young bride, arrived at the manor to begin her life with Jonathan, the enigmatic master of the estate, the manor with its imposing facade and secrets buried deep within its foundations, seemed to exhale a foreboding sigh as Emily crossed the threshold, hand in hand with her new husband. As the couple settled into their chambers, the air seemed to thicken with an unsettling tension. Little did Emily know that the mansion, with its elegant facade, hid a gruesome secret, a secret the screaming skull yearned to reveal. The mansion's history bore the scars of Jonathan's previous marriage, a union steeped in tragedy. His first wife, Eleanor, had vanished mysteriously, leaving behind only whispers of foul play and dark rumours that clung to the mansion like a spectral shroud. Jonathan, a man of quiet demeanour and piercing eyes, carried the weight of the mansion's secrets upon his shoulders. On the eve of their nuptials, as Emily lay in the opulent bed adorned with silk and lace, the room echoed with an otherworldly wail, the chilling sound, reminiscent of a tortured soul, emanated from the direction of a grotesque sculpture on the mantelpiece. The screaming skull, the skull, its hollow eye socket seemingly fixated on Emily, emitted an ethyl scream that reverberated through the chamber. Emily jolted awake, her heart pounding as the phantom cries filled the room. She turned to Jonathan, but he slept soundly beside her, oblivious to the spectral lament. As the night wore on, the screaming skull's wails continued, intensifying with each passing hour. Emily, now racked with fear, ventured into the dimly lit corridors of the mansion, Drawn inexorably toward the haunted sculpture, the ghostly cries seemed to guide her, compelling her to unravel the dark secrets that lurked within the mansion's walls. 
the manor's ancient library with its towering shelves and the musty scent of forgotten tales became Emily's refuge as she delved into the history of the Hawthorne Manor. Old volumes whispered of Eleanor's disappearance, of rumours that painted Jonathan as a man entwined with the shadows that danced in the moonlight. As Emily sought answers, the screaming skull's cries followed her like a ghostly echo. The mansion seemed to come alive with unseen eyes watching, as if the very walls conspired to reveal the truth. With each passing day, the spectral wails intensified, warning Emily of a malevolence that lurked just beneath the surface. Driven by a relentless need to uncover the manor's secrets, Emily unearthed a forgotten diary hidden in the depths of the library. The journal belonged to Eleanor, the ill-fated first wife, and its pages chronicled a life tainted by fear and suspicion. Eleanor wrote of her husband's descent into madness, of hidden passages within the manor, and a forbidden love that led to her demise. The diary hinted at a chilling truth. Eleanor's remains lay hidden in a secret chamber beneath the manor, a silent witness to the twisted tale of love and betrayal. The screaming skull, a vessel of Eleanor's taunted spirit, yearned to expose the grim reality that Jonathan sought to bury along with his first wife. As Emily ventured into the hidden recesses of the manor, guided by the spectral cries and the haunted diary, she uncovered a passage leading to a long-forgotten chamber. The air grew frigid as she entered, and the room seemed frozen in time. At the centre, an ornate coffin lay in a solemn response, adorned with wilted flowers and the echoes of a tragic past. The screaming skull, now eerily silent, cast a hollow gaze upon the scene. Emily, trembling with trepidation, lifted the coffin's lid to reveal Eleanor's remains. An ashen visage frozen in perpetual anguish, the truth unveiled in the flickering candlelight hung heavy in the air. As Emily left the chamber, the air crackled with an eerie and ghostly energy. Emily's breath visible in the cold, frigid air. She travelled the dark corridors to Jonathan's bedroom. Standing at the end of Jonathan's bed, Jonathan awoke. A flash of lightning revealed not Emily, but Eleanor. A chilling cry was heard throughout the mansion. The screaming skull, its spectral purpose fulfilled. Emily, the unwitting vessel of revelation and retribution. Yet as the moon casts its silvery glow upon Hawthorne Manor, the shadows lingered and the ancient oaks whispered of the lingering echoes of love and betrayal that clung to the estate like a haunting melody. And if you stumble upon the long-forgotten chamber of the manor, you'll find the Ornick coffin now has two occupants. In the heart of the whispering woods, the friends' laughter echoed through the ancient trees as they set up their campsite. The air thickened with an otherworldly energy and the atmosphere grew tense. The whispers began, haunting and desperate, weaving a tapestry of sorrow that seemed to echo from the shadows. Centuries ago, when the whispering woods were lush and untouched, the village surrounding it thrived. The forest was revered by the villagers believed to be the dwelling place of benevolent spirits that watched over their community. The trees were said to whisper words of guidance and protection to those who listened. However, the tranquility of the woods was shattered 
when a malevolent force took root within its ancient heart. A dark sorcerer, banished from the village for his wicked deeds, sought revenge by cursing the very source of life that sustained the community. In a twisted ritual, he bound the spirits of the forest to an altar hidden deep within the woods, sealing their fate and corrupting the once sacred ground. As the curse took hold, the whispering woods transformed into a nightmarish realm where reality and illusion coexisted. The spirits, once protectors, became trapped in a perpetual state of anguish, their desperate pleas for salvation weaving into the eerie whispers that echoed through the trees. The curse had a profound impact on the villagers. The once thriving community fell into disarray as misfortune plagued their lives. Crops withered, livestock perished, and darkness loomed over the village like an unrelenting shadow. Fearful of the malevolent force within the woods, the villagers declared the forest forbidden, warning future generations to steer clear of its cursed embrace. Over the years, the true nature of the Whispering Woods faded into legend. The curse persisted, but its origins became obscured by time. The village elders, aware of the malevolent force lurking within, did their best to keep the secret hidden, fearing that any attempt to confront the curse would only further the suffering. As generations passed, the Whispering Woods become a forbidden enigma, a place of mystery and dread. The village thrived in the shadow of the cursed forest, unaware that their very existence was tethered to the malevolence that lurked within the depths. It wasn't until the group of friends, drawn by the allure of the unknown, ventured into the forbidden woods that the echoes of the past began to resurface. The sorcerer's curse, long dormant, stirred to life as the intruders disturbed the ancient seal. The forest once again became a battleground between the malevolent force and those who dared to enter, trapping them in an illusionary nightmare crafted from the darkest corners of their mind. Undeterred, the group pressed on, lured by the flickering shadows that danced ahead. The forest itself seemed to guide them, its branches intertwining overhead, like gnarled fingers reaching out to ensnare the unsuspecting intruders. As the late night deepened, the illusions intensified, and the friends found themselves lost in a maze of spectral visions. They stumbled upon the ancient altar, its stones warm by the passage of time. The whispers became more pronounced, revealing a tale of betrayal and tragedy that had cursed the forest for centuries. To break the curse, they had to navigate the heart of the illusionary labyrinth woven by the malevolent entity that controlled the Whispering Woods. As the group ventured deeper, the illusions became nightmares, exploiting each friend's darkest fears. The forest conjured phantoms from the past and projected twisted versions of the reality. One friend saw a loved one beckoning from the shadows, only to dissolve into a grotesque spectre. Another confronted a manifestation of guilt that clawed at their sanity. The forest reveled in their terror, its sinister laughter echoing the twisted pathways. The group's bonds frayed as paranoia and fear tore at their unity. Shadows morphed into grotesque figures that whispered promises of escape, only to lead them further into the forest's clutches. In a ghastly revelation, the friends realized that the forest thrived on the fear it cultivated. The illusions became more sadistic, blurring the line between nightmare and reality. As they stumbled through the labyrinth, they witnessed their own deaths in horrifying detail, each demise more gruesome than the last. As the last friend faced the grotesque embodiment of the Whispering Woods, 
a malevolent entity woven from the shadows and twisted branches, a chilling revelation occurred. The forest, an entity with a hunger for fear, was not bound solely to its wooden realm. In a harrowing twist, the entity began to seep into the very minds of the friends, merging the illusions with reality. The friends, now trapped in a shared nightmare, struggled to distinguish between the forest's illusions and their own perceptions. The whispering woods, having tasted the depths of their fear, manifested nightmarish creatures that lurked in the shadows, waiting to pounce on their fractured souls. The forest's sinister laughter echoed through their minds, becoming a haunting symphony of madness. As the illusions intensified, the boundaries between the spectral visions and the real world blurred. The friends turned on each other, their sanity unraveling as the whispering woods fed off their escalating paranoia. In a climatic scene, the grotesque entity revealed its true intention to merge the friend's fear into a collective nightmare, ensuring its sustained existence beyond the forest's confines. They could not distinguish the illusions from reality, and the friends found themselves trapped in a nightmarish loop of horror, unable to escape. The only way to break free from the forest's malevolent grip was to confront the darkness within themselves. Each friend had to face their own personal demons, battling the twisted reflections of their fears that the forest had conjured. As they fought against their inner terrors, the forest convulsed, its grip loosening with every conquered fear. The grotesque entity howled in anguish as the friends now united against a common enemy shattered the illusions that bound them. In a final act of defiance, they expelled the whispering woods from the collective consciousness. Yet the horror persisted. The forest's malevolent presence lingered in their minds, a haunting reminder that the line between reality and nightmare is thin and the echoes of the whispering woods would forever reverberate within their souls. The remaining friend, tormented by hallucinations and haunted by the echoes of their worst nightmares, faced the grotesque embodiment of the whispering woods. The entity, a twisted amalgamation of twisted branches and malevolent shadows, taunted them with visions of their deepest fears in a desperate bid for survival, the friend confronted the entity head-on, challenging the illusion that bound the forest's curse. The illusions shattered like glass, and the forest recoiled, releasing the friend from its grip. Yet, the victory was bittersweet as the whispering woods fell silent, leaving the friends to emerge from the trees physically intact but forever scarred by the horrors they had witnessed. As they returned to the village, the whispers lingered in their minds and the shadows of the forest clung to their souls. The illusions may have been dispelled, but the psychological torment endured, haunting their every step. The whispering woods, now free of its illusionary curse, watched in silence patiently waiting for the next unsuspecting intruders to dance beneath its ancient canopy. Thank you for joining me on this chilling journey. If your thirst for the unknown and the unexplained is still unquenched, I invite you to delve deeper into the abyss of terror. Just beyond the veil of reality, Another story awaits to send shivers down your spine. Dare to join me in the next video, where the unknown becomes known and the unseen seen. Until then, keep the lights dim and your mind open. This is Professor Shadow, signing off.